This episode of the Managing Madrid Podcast is brought to you by the Managing Madrid Podcast preseason tour in the United States. We are following Real Madrid in Los Angeles, Houston, and Dallas, and doing a podcast in each of those cities while also going to the games and the training sessions. If you would like to join the party in each of those cities, go to the show notes and book your spot. You can click the link, get your tickets, reserve your spot, do it quickly because the prices go up. You can also get a chance to win stuff that are signed by Real Madrid players and also meet a bunch of like-minded Madridistas that you'll form lifelong friendships with. So if that sounds cool to you, Make sure to book your spot in L.A., Houston, and Dallas by clicking the link in the show notes. This episode is also brought to you by Blossom Hotel Houston, who are hosting our podcast in Houston. Personalized, attentive service, public spaces with panache, and spacious accommodations outfitted with thoughtful touches are hallmarks of the distinctive property where premier amenities range from a rooftop pool with expansive skyline views to a plethora of of elegant meeting and event spaces ideal for memorable occasions. Book your spot to, if you go, well, let me just rephrase that. If you're going to Houston and you're going to the game at NRG Stadium, make sure to book your spot at Blossom because it's close to the stadium and it's also just incredible. It's close to everything in Houston, really. And as I said, rooftop pool, that sounds good to you. Book your spot at Blossom Hotel Houston when you travel to Houston for the game. Coming up is a clip taken from last week's Emergency Art of Guler podcast. So the day Guler was signed officially, uh, it actually coincided with our weekly Zoom call for patrons. So we threw it all together, Emergency Art of Guler episode. It went two hours and it was live on Zoom. Patrons also uh, asked us questions virtually face-to-face after we Mehdi and I finished the Art of Guler analysis. So uh, if you wanted access to the thing in real time and also all the weekly Zoom calls moving forward, you can catch that at patreon.com slash managing Madrid, where we are also releasing tonight. Tonight is what? Tuesday. Later tonight, uh, we'll also release a podcast about Mbappe, which was recorded with PSG correspondent in Paris, Jonathan Johnson, a good friend of the show. We talked about the latest on Mbappe, that Sega, and his relationship with PSG, which is deteriorating. That's over on patreon.com slash management. Okay. Uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. Hope you enjoy it. And here it is. I so It was interesting because you mentioned like you hadn't really heard about him. I mean, we were getting questions about him uh, a few weeks ago. I think it was around the time, like the week when... It was reported that Barcelona were looking to sign him. A few days later, I think I'm, I might be getting this wrong. But based on memory, a few days later, Real Madrid were linked with him, and so we started to get questions about him on the podcast. And I kind of like it went through stages, right? My my initial reaction was like, I am severely underqualified to speak about this person. I've never seen play, so I, I apologize. I can't really tell you anything. I've seen the same things you've seen. YouTube compilations. Uh, I do not w- watch the Turkish league. I apologize. And I can't pretend to be an expert on this. Um, and then there were stages and like kind of like became a little bit more real in some sense. So the next time the question came up, it was like, okay, I can speak a little bit about based on what I've read. Um, but that's, again, this is based on what I've read. I've never seen him play. And uh, then it became like really real, you know, uh, pretty much yesterday. And then this morning when I woke up, I I kind of did a deep dive. I was like, okay, I'm going to watch a bunch of film. I'm going to read up more, look into it. And uh, I came away with some kind of semi-informed opinion, which I'll write about soon more comprehensively. But I feel like we have enough to to launch the discussion about who this guy is and how he's going to be used. What's his player profile? What are the player comps and all that stuff? Um you had put out a cryptic tweet yesterday, I think it was, where you had basically prepared your visuals, right? Your like what his ball progression visuals, his passing visuals, whatever. So you have that prepared. Uh, I don't even know. I, I didn't speak to you about this off air to see if like you maybe even have those handy. We could do share screen quickly. And if you don't, that's OK. But um, what did what did you come away with that kind of caught your eye? 
Yeah, so it's funny because as I just mentioned that Real Madrid usually like takes their time. I was going to like release uh, one of the visuals each day before like they officially announce him because I thought it, it's going to take them at least a week. So I had like uh, looked into five or six different things. Unfortunately, I don't have all of them with me right now. I think I have one tweet where I put out his take-ons uh, and like the areas where he like yeah, dribbles the most and a little stat about that as well. But uh, one thing I am actually grateful to the Barcelona fans in this regard is that like they have prepared all the highlight comps and all the videos <laughs> for Arta Guler so that we can watch them and like gauge what kind of a player he is. So shout out to the Kules for that. And, yeah, they, uh, they, I, they have a lot of Vitor uh, Roque uh, highlights ready too. And now that, that seems to be stumbling now too. I don't know how, if they fumble that one, <laughs> unbelievable. I don't think they'll really go that far to fumble that one. But the fact that it's actually not official yet and now they're getting ultimatums is hilarious to me. Anyways. Yeah. So, and, and this, <laughs> this is actually funny because... They have this kind of a comp about Vinicius, Rodrigo, Camavinga, all of our players. They have like Vinicius in a Barcelona shirt, Rodrigo in a Barcelona shirt and highlight comps. So next time Barcelona is scouting a player and putting out videos like that, guys, watch out. That that guy just might just end up at Real Madrid at some point in time. But uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it was so the things I can I can definitely like talk through the things I observed in the visuals that I, I have in the back end. I will be publishing them soon uh, in, in some kind of format in an article or, or in terms of tweets. But uh, the things that I have, uh, you know, seen, they look interesting from a analytic point of view. And I think uh, he can add some immediate value to the Real Madrid uh, existing team, uh, which I <laughs> we will be discussing further during this episode. Yeah, I think, you know, it's it remains to be seen. I mean, there is what we know about him, what we're excited about. And then there's the other side of this, which is how much will he play? Mm-hmm. Um, at all, all signs do point to him being on the first team next season. We know he's going to be part of preseason. That only means so much because everyone's part of preseason. Castilla players, everyone play, returning from loan, they'll, they'll all be there. And then, after that, they kind of get dispersed around Europe, wherever they need to go. But I, I don't think Arda Guler will be dispersed after preseason. Uh, it seems like he's going to stay. What I think is interesting... Now, he is, he, these are the challenges that he'll have. He, like... I know that from a stylistic profile standpoint, there is no one really like him in the squad. But that, mm-hmm. that, that only means so much partly because regardless of how you play and what your style of play is, it's still occupied by, a, by players who have to play that position. Bellingham needs to get minutes. Uh, Rodrigo needs to get minutes. Fede Valverde needs to get minutes. All these guys need to get minutes. And though they're not pure right wingers, the players I just listed, a lot of them will occupy the third attacking slot at various points of the season. And that doesn't include Brahim Diaz, who I've not included in that mix, but is another player to consider. But but that also does work in Guler's favor in some sense, that what he brings to the table as someone who is left-footed can play as a right winger. Um, stylistically, there's no one like him in the squad. And I mentioned this on Twitter, but the players that Real Madrid have in their umbrella who are similar to him in some capacity, like Takefusa Kubo, who we have the rights to still, like Sergio Arribas, who can play on the right wing, can play down the middle. These guys are kind of on the fringes. It remains to be seen how much Real Madrid actually trusts those guys to use those guys. Brahim Diaz, not a similar stylistic profile, but similar in the sense that he can play on both wings and he can play centrally. Um, so those are the things to consider. I, again, I don't really know how this will play out next season no one does um and and you know even if some people think they have some idea of what carlo will do still have no idea what carlo will do when the season starts and carlo sees these guys up close and then changes his decisions and and ultimately decides on his best lineup and and this and that so i i don't really know what that means but let's talk about arda arda's like just player profile um who did you see the comp as because you know many people said messi 
many people said Ozil, that's an easy one. You know, the Turkish roots, Fenerbahce, um, number 10, left-footed, can play on the wing, can cut in. Uh, the one I came away with, like, just as a name that I hadn't seen anyone use was Angel Di Maria. Very similar in the sense that can break lines, can play a little bit deeper, um, but can, can be a devastating attacker, unpredictable type of player, hard to defend, great passes into the box, can shoot from distance. That's another one that I hadn't seen that I, that I thought was interesting. But are there any other names that, that, that you thought of? Yeah, so the Messi comparison is interesting. And just as I mentioned previously that, Thanks, shout out to the Kules for making all those comps. There is one compilation of Arda Guler where like there are like five or six of iconic Messi goals dribbles. Like they first show the Messi clip, then they show the Arda clip and they're like exactly identical. And I respect that kind of uh, like time and effort that was taken to create that clip. I truly respect that. And uh, you're right, there are, there are a lot of like Messi things, young, very young Messi, like when Messi was 19, uh, very uh, unhealthy Maria on the right wing esque stuff. Uh, one thing, like I saw, uh, I- I'd be really interested to know in a few years, like what kind of uh, upbringing as a youth player he had. Like he's, he's still very young, because some of the things, like uh, at at which foot he's receiving the ball, uh, what's his body orientation, these like di- little details when he's like getting out of tight space, those things look very impressive already uh, as they were with someone like Kamavinga like at a very young age like the basics that are discussed so very often in this day and age those things look already very polished which impressed me very much uh, and th- that is where I from where I started to think that this guy can add value to the team immediately because as you mentioned he has a profile that none of our right wing options at the moment they don't like uh, our right wing options are what if if Rodrigo is playing center forward, then uh, Fede is gonna play play right wing, and Fede is more of a defensive minded. He he's a line breaker, but he's not as much of a dribbler as probably Arda is. Uh, a Bra- Brahim is. I always like see Brahim as a less talented and less sophisticated version of Asensio, which is not also as exciting as probably Arda is right now. Uh, and if someone like Jose Lu is playing, Jose Lu is playing center forward or someone else is playing center forward, then Rodrigo is going to play on the right wing. Rodrigo, again, he brings different things into the game, but he is more of a prolific dribbler on the left wing than on the right. So Arda pretty much brings that kind of presence on the right. And another thing, like when I was making my visuals, I originally when I heard about him and people were making comparisons with Ozil, I thought like, all right, he's probably a Hamas Rodriguez, Ozil type of a player. But his like top three passing clusters are all across the right wing, like in the defensive third, in the mid third, in the attacking third. So he is actually a right-sided midfielder. If you don't want to call him an out and out, right winger that's also fine because his you know dribbles his take-ons are not really very deep into the right wing they're probably just below the right half space uh, so those kind of things the profile makes him a really interesting player and on the part that what will happen with him that's actually true we don't know we don't know how much game time he's gonna get what kind of role he's gonna have in the team what do we probably do know that he will stay at Real Madrid because that was probably one of the key points in the negotiations that he doesn't want to go to another Fenerbahce kind of a team. He wants to stay in a top team. And th- that was one of the main points that led Real Madrid in the negotiations. So even if he stays, we don't know what kind of a role he will have. But this season is like is going to be strange in so many ways. Uh, one example I always bring regarding like Ancelotti changing his team up during the seasons. If you remember in the first game of the 2021-2022 season in La Liga, uh, Hazard and Gareth Bale started on both wings. Yeah. So from there, there on, Ancelotti actually changed his team quite a lot. Yeah. And last season we saw Rodrigo taking more of a... Uh, prominent role uh, in the attack more as a central presence uh, 
So even if we don't see Arda starting or you know not getting any game time at all in the first few games, things can change as the season progresses. But the other side of this coin is that this is a season that Ancelotti doesn't have anything to do with these players beyond the season. So he would want to have kind of a safety net, I presume, uh, during throughout the season to to you know end on a finish on a safe note, finish on a good note. For that, he might just trust the more experienced players more, like players like Fede Ibrahim. So from that point of view, we don't know what's going to happen with Arda. Again, this is like very early. Real Madrid hasn't you know trained for a single minute in preseason even this season. This is just pure speculation, but we'll see what what happens uh, as the season progresses. Yeah, it's it's very I, like I, I'd be surprised if Arda was you know from the jump someone who's playing regularly. I, I I'd be shocked. I mean, even Kamavinga himself, who's way ahead of his age group, took a long time to break through. Uh, you know, it wasn't really until his second season that he became a bona fide starter. And I, I don't I don't really see Guler even you know being at the level Kamavinga was in the second. So I just want just I think it's important to pump the brakes a little bit. Um, Someone mentioned in the chat, I think it was Anthony, uh, brought up Dybala. Yeah, I mean, Dybala is another good one. His his former manager, Victor Pereira, said today that Dybala and uh, oh, who was the other one that he mentioned? Do you remember this? Uh, yeah, he mentioned Dybala for sure. I think James Rodriguez. Yeah, James Rodriguez. yeah that, he, he said uh, a hybrid of James and Dybala <clears throat> and a hybrid between a 10 and an 8. Excuse me. Um he he also was it was interesting because he was talking about strengths and weaknesses and he said um Arda could be faster, he could be stronger. Um I think those are two criticisms that are fair. I, I also think, you know, for all the good that I think he is, and and I was I came away mostly impressed with my deep dive this morning that this is a guy that is kind of for the future, but he may break through sooner. Um of course, nothing is a given. We've seen plenty of young, talented players fizzle out. Uh, the uh, The other problem I see is the sample size is not huge. He has been good at pretty much every level, youth team level. That should be said. But, you know, we haven't seen him in the top five leagues yet. Uh, but the little sample size that we do have and you know to be fair it's not tiny tiny you know it's not like half a season he was pretty pretty great and pretty well a thousand minutes which is a good sample. like a thousand minutes is generally a good sample size once you see a thousand minutes of something you can form a good like picture of what this player is generally speaking um anything under a thousand is kind of hard to take away things definitively but he had about a thousand minutes and uh, I thought it was interesting because James Horncastle wrote about this in The Athletic, and I'll just quote him. He says uh, he put out all of his metrics. First in assists per 90 in the league. First in key passes per 90. First in open play passes in the final third per 90. First in successful dribbles per 90. First in possession adjusted pressures per 90. First in counter pressures per 90. The last point, the counter pressures, something that I... Um, kind of observed with my deep dive this morning was that he is really good defensively behind the ball. When you're starting to ask him to track on the wing, a little bit more problematic. I don't know if that's his strength defensively yet. Uh, Similar to Asensio in that Asensio could press, but asking him to track and hop Carvajal on the right wing is, is very hit or miss. So that's something I think you'll have to improve on. Um, To be fair with Guler too, in on the international stage, he's looked really good. I think I but I do think like I think the fan base in some sense is getting a little bit carried away with how good he is. They may very well be right, and the hype may well be justified when we look back on this discussion five years from now. But I do think it's still fair to say we have no idea how this will pan out. We just know what we know now, and we need to see it at a higher level. We need to see how he deals with pressure. All that stuff, but so far I think it's it's promising, Mehdi. Yeah, I think I think it's promising, and uh, I think it's correct to say that uh, we we absolutely don't know how this is going to pan out. This can this can be 
this can go two routes. This can go the Vinicius route or this can go the Rainier route. We have uh, examples of both at our club. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and even if he's like, it takes the Rodrigo route, uh, I'll be I'll be more than happy. So uh, let's let's wait and see. But he's definitely an exciting player. And the the points that you made uh, you know made about uh, his coach mentioning the things that he can improve upon. Of course, like he's eighteen. Of course, he's gonna get stronger as he gets older. Uh, I think the pace uh, also will will be there. But uh, what what impressed me most was like his his line breaking and getting out of like tight situations because as we have, as Vinicius has taken this leap and has grown, what we have seen that our opponents are very comfortable containing us on the right because when Real Madrid have possession on the left, the opponent has to react really fast. So like Vinicius is going to like finish them in four or five seconds. But on the right, we don't have that, you know, they don't have that urgency so they can, you know, shape themselves better. They can organize themselves better and then like counter press and do such things. But if if Arda Guler evolves into the player that he is promising to be, uh, then we can have that kind of a presence on the right as well. And that that can be invaluable for, for the batch of young players that Real Madrid have right now. That can be invaluable. Someone who can actually be reliable when Cruz switches the ball to the right and actually do damage from that side is is always welcome. I do want to make a point about Rainier and like how this this could go one way or the other. One point about Rainier is that when you look at Vinicius, Rodrigo, Rainier, these guys all had one thing in common in that it was always going to be a calculated risk because it wasn't a huge sample size of established players. Rainier only played 14 games in at the senior level in Brazil before we signed him. Uh, granted, he was young. It was just a gamble, that's all. And, um, you know, Rainier is still 21. I personally believe that he's just not good enough for Real Madrid at this point. He's not even starting for Girona. I mean, it, it doesn't mean he's not going to have a good career somewhere. I think he's young enough to recover and do some something with his career. Um, but Vinicius and Rodrigo were absolute home runs. If, because you mentioned if if he becomes Rodrigo, you'd be happy. If he becomes Rodrigo, I'd be really happy. I mean, Rodrigo is fantastic. He's awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. But Arda is more established and more known than Rainier was when we signed him. So I yeah. think it's just just to point that out. Um, the other thing is that Victor Pereira said today that uh, his decision making is one of his strengths. I came away kind of like based on my scouting report. I think I felt that he that's something he actually could improve on. I think it the thing with him is that when you look at his compilations, excuse me, when you look at his compilations, it's very easy to say, well, his decision making is unreal. <laughs> because those are his highlights. Those are literally his best decisions in the compilation. When you when you watch it, when you kind of zoom out and look at the totality of it, uh, I think he, his decision making could improve. I say that not as a criticism. I say that as something that's something completely natural with young players. Any young player who's like ahead of the, their peers at the age group has a tendency to just be a little bit more flashy, a little bit more extra because he can be, because he can humiliate defenders, because it looks so good. Um, maybe sometimes over dribble it because Arda is an amazing dribbler. And so there are sometimes tendencies with players like that to do a little bit more than they need to. Arda will just, just like Vinicius had to, learn to just channel that into efficiency as he progresses. I think it's a, it's a natural kind of thing that most players have to work on at his age. So, so just wanted to point that out as well. Um, anything else that you wanted to bring up before we take questions? Yeah, just one point about like his decision-making and decision-making in football in general. I think this also, often we don't take into account what kind of system a player is playing when we uh, judge or discuss the the decision-making. Because if you're playing in a system where, uh, for example, a pass, there are only a limited number of passing angles that are open for you on the right flank. And whatever you do from there, uh, it's going to reach reach a teammate uh, in a good position. That has got a lot to do with 
the the system you're playing. So as a young guy, I think uh, it'll be interesting to see who Real Madrid's manager. Well, Ancelotti is not going to be here next season. It's confirmed now. So uh, who I mean, Real Madrid next? You mean two seasons from now? Uh, yeah, no, I mean like yeah, two seasons yeah, yeah. from now. Yeah. So uh, after that season, whoever arrives, it's going to be interesting that uh, how much that's affecting uh, the decision making of the players because Ancelotti, Zidane, they they like a bit more flexibility and freedom, especially in the final third, uh, and let the players express themselves a bit. Probably that is not the case for a Tuchel or a Pep where the system defines the decisions that you should take or the best decisions at hand. Probably that is not the case for other managers. And there's like no like better or worse here. I'm just defining the di- difference. So if we, for example, if we bring back uh, or, or if we bring someone like Xavi Alonso next season, uh, artist de- decision-making might look different as opposed to if we like appoint Raul or someone like that. So... Uh, that's that's just a point about decision making in general. I wanted to make. Uh, yeah, I, I also just wanted to say that I I think he'll be part of the first team this season, but I also wouldn't be one hundred percent shocked if he went out on loan. Um, I have I have zero inside information on this. I'm this is just completely me talking at a, a you know just a hunch, but. I don't think it would be absolutely shocking if he did go out on loan because I think when you look at how many players we have that need playing time in the squad next season, um, I think it would be really disappointing. Like by the end of the year, we just don't see this guy play, you know, at all. And um, is it worth to keep him around? Granted training with some of the best players in the world at Real Madrid, or is it better for him to just go, you know, you know, this is not even on the table, I don't think, but imagine you could just shoot him back to uh, Federbache for a year while still owning him, or you just, you know, somewhere that really made sense for him that it could use his player profile for a year. It's not off the table for me completely, although I still think that he'll probably be part of the first team next season. Um, it does feel like a little bit of a sword through my heart because I think... This prob I don't this probably is not great news for Aribas, but uh it is what it is. Uh all right, we're gonna take some questions. Uh a lot of you guys are just joining now. That's totally fine. But so what you've missed so far is that uh we just spent the past nearly 30 minutes talking about Arda Guler. And uh if you're joining now, just you know, we'll post this entire podcast up later and just go listen to that segment. Now we're going to take some questions, okay? So we have two hands up already. We're going to take those. So if you have a question, now will be the time to raise your virtual hand. We're going to, I mean, we talked about Arda Guler. You guys can ask Guler questions if you want. You can ask us anything you want, really. I mean, these the benefit of these Zoom calls, just ask ask away. We can go in a bunch of different directions. We can go, uh, we can uh, do 180s. We can flip the script if we want to. It's all good. Your call. Yusuf, unmute, please. How are you doing? Oh, I think I muted you by accident after you unmuted. Try again. I'm good, Ken. How are you? Beautiful. Great. Thank you. What's up? Uh, Am I audible? Yep, we can hear you. Perfect. Uh, Before I uh, ask my question, I just wanted to say I'm so grateful uh, to be here today. Uh, I have been uh, a huge, huge, huge fan of managing Madrid and you especially, Ken. Uh, I've been following you uh, I don't know for how many years, but in a world world of ESPN pundits and Sky Sports pundits giving us absolutely no uh, proper, uh, you know, after content of football matches when it comes to Real Madrid and doing justice to our players and mostly La Liga and being so blindsided uh, regarding anything that's not English football to have managing Madrid and like, podcast like thrice four times a week is a blessing uh it is addictive uh i subscribed to patreon like a while ago uh but then i couldn't afford it in um uh, in between and now i subscribed again like a few days ago so i'm just gr- grateful that i'm getting this opportunity and thank you 
thank you to all of you for doing what you guys do. It's it means a lot. Awesome. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate those words. I'm sure Mahedi does too. It means a lot. Thanks for being yeah. part of the family, man. Thank you. Yeah. So my question is, uh, what do you guys think uh, of the chances of Aragular turning into a signing like Odegaard? <laughs> I don't get me wrong. Uh, while Odegaard was much younger when he was signed. And I remember, remember that even Odegaard had a huge, huge hype in world football at that time. And there were so many clubs after him and we hyped them so much and he went out on several loans and all of that. But unfortunately, due to the uh, amount of midfielders uh, and the tenured midfielders we had in our uh, roster at that, at that point, we just couldn't find a spot and especially a spot for a player like Aragular or Odegaard who uh, who play more in an attacking midfielder option like a Cam or, you know, because from all the compilations that I've seen of Aragular, I haven't seen him, you know, have that breakthrough pace like Rodrigo or Vinicius. So I'm not sure how the... How much of a possibility it is that he will turn into like an out, out and out winger, right, right winger, and his best position seems to be ahead of the center midfielders. And I just wonder what are the chances that having Bellingham and Fede and all these young midfielders that we already have would, you know, come in the way of giving him a chance in our squad, you know, and where he he is a b brilliant player, but due to just uh, the timing that he may end up like a great player at a different club years down the line, like Odegaard. Because that's the comparison that comes to my mind right away more than any other player. The You know, being, him being that young and all of that. This is a great question. Uh, I think this is uh, a question worth exploring and discussing further. Mehdi, do you want to take a crack at it first? Yeah, uh, I, I was... <laughs> I was hoping this would come up. I'm probably the worst guy to talk about Odegaard because I've been very hard since he left Real Madrid, but I'll, I'll break it down like my thoughts. Uh, why I think it shouldn't and it, it will not be in another Odegaard case because uh, I think Odegaard was a bit of a one-off uh, regarding how he left the club and uh, everything that happened during he left the club. Some of the narratives that uh, were established when he left the club are to me they're just not true like for example one of the things that are said that he spent five years on loan to for his chance at Real Madrid uh, and then he was still not given time but in none of like apart from the Sociedad year uh, there was not a single year when he was good enough to break into the Real Madrid starting 11 when he played at Sociedad he was and even after like when he returned I think Odegaard got injured twice and before he got injured the second time before that, he I, I actually went in and looked at the numbers. Zidane played him 40% of the total minutes and then like things went south and he went to the Arsenal loan and then signed for them permanently a uh, year after. So uh, why I don't think that this will happen is for like for every Odegaard, there are other players who actually want to stay here and fight uh, no matter what, for example, Chuomini is a good shout. Chuomini was pretty much like outcasted in important games, despite being, I would say, a more established player in, at the international level than Odegaard. Uh, this might be like fetching it a bit too far, but. Mehdi, Mehdi you just muted yourself. Can you? Did you guys not hear anything? Yeah, or... we, we heard. No, we heard most of it. It was just like that yeah. last second. Yeah, yeah. So the Chua Many uh, uh, is staying. So there is uh, a Kamavinga who didn't get as many minutes in the first season. Then he became became a starter. Uh, so I think there are you know less chances of happening Odegaard because Odegaard leaving Real Madrid to me is it's still not a byproduct of how Real Madrid did things. 
uh, I think it was more of a personal choice and uh, he made that choice good, good for him. Uh, I don't think Real Madrid is like hurting because Odegaard is, uh, has left because like, look who we have signed. We have signed Jude Bellingham. So it, it's Real Madrid. He, he, we will fix things over time. Uh, yeah. Uh, so for, for my take on that is I, I, I think the sample size of players who have had less game time and haven't left Real Madrid in recent times, it's bigger than just Odegaard who decided to leave because he wanted a more prominent role. So from that perspective, I think, uh, and and especially the news that how we are seeing that he was impressed by the project and all, Juni Kalafat spoke to him. There was even talk of like Luka Modric speaking to him and telling him that he can have his number 10 jersey after Modric retired. So Yeah, I was skeptical uh, of that one when I saw it. I was like, who who knows that yeah, like and, how and, Modric said that to him and said, You're like you're getting my number 10, I'm leaving next. That just felt like too much like very uh, private asked, conversation asked, if that happened. Diario asked, they are saying like first they said Juni Kalafat spoke to him. Then they said Luka Modric spoke to him. Then they said Florentino spoke to him. Then they said Ancelotti spoke to him. I'm like, how many people from Real Madrid did he speak to? <laughs> Probably a lot, but uh, go, going back to the Odegaard part again, uh, I think uh, uh, this is a Real Madrid team where there are a lot of young players who will, who seem to be eager to fight it out, uh, which Odegaard didn't to me. And uh, yeah. I, I hope uh, I don't see this happening with him. I think I I still think it was a one-off. Ultimately, Odegaard. The problem with Odegaard was Odegaard himself. It and I don't mean Odegaard was like the problem was his footballing ability. The problem was that he just didn't want to stay and fight it out. And that's a decision, a right he has to make. The problem wasn't necessarily the club, you know. Uh, the club didn't actively push him out, nor did they force him to stay. The club has generally never been, uh, this has never generally been a club that handcuffs players and, and forces them to stay against their will. Odegaard wanted to leave. He has the right to do that. I will say one thing that I think we made a mistake on Odegaard is that we ended his Real Sociedad loan early. Yeah, true. When we shouldn't have. Because everyone was happy there. We were happy seeing him develop there. Real Sociedad was, I mean, obviously happy. Odegaard was thriving. He was living in San Sebastian, the star of Real Sociedad. And we ended his loan stint early. And I think that just, at that point, it was like almost the point of no return. The relationship between him and Zidane was severed at that point. And he he left. I think his player profile would have been great for us because again he's not a pure right winger but he's someone who could have played that position and helped us a lot from a creative standpoint and his pressing numbers were off the charts but uh i think this discussion goes into something deeper and that you know yusuf was asking if if this is becoming another odegaard and i don't know if this is what yusuf was asking necessarily but this is what i thought of is that another player that you can compare stylistically to arda is odegaard left-footed players, surgical passes, mazy dribblers can get out of pressure. Um, similar in that sense. We've been getting a lot of questions like, is this actually problematic? Because a lot of the players who have failed in recent memory at Real Madrid were players who played the number 10. The players that are starting to vanish in modern football, the James, the Isco, etc., um, and I don't, I don't think like to me, like the, the death of the number 10, it's not so much a, a death of the number 10. It's that it's been I mean, a lot of teams actually still play with the number 10s. Um, uh, a lot of teams play with double tens. Brahim Diaz, who just came from Milan was playing at a, in a number 10 and a four, two, three, one. Um, but I do think tens need to be more versatile now than they ever have been long gone are the days where, uh, number 10 like just roams around the field and, and and just plays a free role, doesn't defend and just waits to get the ball and pull strings. You know, tens need to play on both wings now. Tens need to play deeper if needed. And so like the modern 10 to me in some ways is like Jude Bellingham. He's not a 
10, but he can be a 10. He's not a winger, but he can be a winger. He's not a CM, but he can be a CM. He's a bit of everything. And that's the 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 direction that Real Madrid are heading in. And so I think the thing with Arda that saves him is that he's not just a number 10, right? He, he can play on the right wing. He can play as a 10 if needed. Um, he can play a little bit deeper if needed. So I don't see that part of it being a problem. I also think this this idea of Arda turning into an Odegaard is like, we just have no idea. Because like if he does turn into another Odegaard in the sense that he leaves, we don't know that until two, three years from now. Because that's how long it'll take. Because right now he is with all due respect, has no right to come in and start swinging his dick around and saying, I'm Arda Guler. I need to start any minutes. I need to bench Moritz. I need to bench Cruz. Like, he doesn't have that right now. <laughs> if he becomes that good in two, three years, that's a conversation you have in two, three years. But I, I think it's too soon. Like, we've had variations of this question, too, with Rodrigo, like asking, do you think Rodrigo will be fed up with being the guy who is kind of on the fringes of the 11? He doesn't get to start every game. Vinicius gets the left wing, we get a striker, you know, all these players coming in, Rodrigo is not guaranteed starter. Do you think he'll be fed up? And like, again, I think it's too soon to have these conversations. We just don't know. We'll know in two, three years if if that actually arises. I assume, I assume Watership Cruz will be gone in two, three years. I have no idea. You know, we we said that two, three years ago. We just, you know, who knows? But I, I assume they will literally be gone. But uh I think I do agree with Mehdi that I think Odegaard was a bit of an exception. Kovacic is another one. Like these guys have all the rights to just get up and leave because they don't feel like competing with Modric and Cruz, arguably the two, you know, in arguably the two of the greatest center midfielders of all time. So, um, but I, I do think that the timing for players like Kovacic and Odegaard was problematic for them. Then you have the alternate examples, which is Fede Valverde, who, did break through and did stick it out. Maybe it would have changed for him if Kovacic decided to stay. So, you know, there's, I think there's examples either way, but I, I guess I'm optimistic that I think Odegaard was a little bit of a, a different case in my opinion. Does that answer your question, Yusuf? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so All much. All right, my you man. Thanks for joining, buddy. Appreciate it. We're going to move on to uh, Mahan. Mahan, are you there? Hi, everyone. Can you hear uh, me? Yes, we can. Are you in Iran? Yes. How's it going, man? Good, man. How are you? It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, Kian, I'm today and yesterday I thought about this transfer and I didn't reach any conclusion. We were probably talking about the best midfielders and uh, in the world. Some of them going to sit on the bench for rest of the season. I feel sad for Brian Diaz. Probably that dude not even get a chance to sit on the bench. He, ha- he has to sit with Ferentino per- Perez in a stance. That's that's going to be really, really uh, hard situation. And I don't know what is the purpose of the signing. We are not a stepping, a stepping stone club. And he's not going to develop. He's not going to be developed if he's going to sit on the bench. Uh, the way I see it, sorry, uh, the way I see it, uh, Florentino Perez needs kind of exit move, uh, probably in future, in next week, two weeks, the mess going to happen, this mess that these Spanish, uh, the Spanish media started, and Florentino Perez, uh, he's, He's there for blaming. He exposed us when the fans ask him about Kylian Mbappe. He just could say, no, we don't sign him. And he said, we will sign him next season. And now we don't have the number nine. The way I see it, uh, there is a Lamborghini in this squad that without no wheels, we cannot compete. We cannot race with it, even bicycle. Barcelona with that bicycle can beat us because we don't have the wheels in this car. And I remember uh, last year, I remember, I remember last year uh, in that Mbappe emergency podcast, Jose bring very, very interesting point. By the way, Mr. Sobhani, what do you do with this managing Madrid staff? They are missing one by one. and We don't know what happened to them. <laughs> can you explain what happened to that dude? 
He was very, very, <laughs> very good pundits. <laughs> he's still around. He's going to be with us. Don't worry. He's going to be with us. Yeah, he's just... Uh, I mean, it's summer. Like, summer it can be hit or miss. But I mean, no one can damage the legend of Mr. Sobhani. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> I don't I know mean, what do you many do. People many people can. Many people can. Many people can. No, 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 no. So... But uh, he asked you, he, he asked you in that particular, particular podcast, he asked you where all this saga put Florentino Perez at and you all on agree that uh, Florentino Perez saved by Vinicius that season. I mean, this season, we, we missed this season because of we didn't have that replacement for carrying. Uh, if we lose the next season, Florentino Perez needs someone probably uh, to do a PR damage, PR damage to Laporta or to Barcelona. Show something. I don't know. I actually don't know. But because the way I see it, if the next season Mbappe do this, do the, do all this stuff to us again, and next season going to be ruined by by this policy of club. For me, I want everybody resignation on the table. I I don't know, hundred and twenty years image of club going to be tarnished by by Keith and his mother. I, I I can't accept it. I don't know. I want I want to know what's your take on this on, on the, all this, this system. Uh, Mahan, is there a way to you can kind of turn this into a, a question? Because I'm not entirely sure what the question is. What do you expect from the club if if next season going to this humiliation? Because club exposes us to the, the world. Everybody make fun of us because of Mbappe. I remember one of my friends uh, said, I, I told him that ship has said we never going to sign, sign him again last season. And he told me, you're going to be on your knees. You're going to kiss his feet and he, next season, everything. And that's happened. I, I'm, I'm really angry that's happened again. And our fans shows shamelessly this, this weakness against Mbappe and I can't I can't tolerate that absolutely Lucas said it the other day uh, he said man he did that one week before Champions League and same thing happened again and again I don't know what's your take what what do you ex- expect from the club if next season happen again and and if if next season he we wait for him and he sign a new contract again we cannot rule that out what so, do you think about that? Yeah, so I hear you, Mahan. I, I hear what you're saying. I understand. I, I think you bring up valid points. I also, this, despite me disagreeing with Lucas that podcast, I also said that I think he brought up great points and I don't, I think he has the right to feel that way. And I don't disagree with him in that aspect. Like everyone has the right to feel, like I, I, I wasn't happy when he was, you know, smirking during that, you know, a few days before the Champions League final either. I think it's important to distinguish how fans are behaving and how the club is behaving because I think there are different things. So if if Real Madrid is, if we're being made fun of because fans are shameless about um, wanting Mbappe, that's different. I don't think Florentino is behaving the way fans are. I think what Florentino is doing is looking at this strictly in business terms and sporting terms. Is this guy going to take us to another level? Um, we then and and if we can get him, we get him. We become a, a massive contender for years to come in every competition. I don't think he looks at it that way. Keep in mind this, and I said this to Lucas, that you're speaking about a president so ruthless and so uh, so focused on business and sporting and not PR that. He signed Luis Figo, a player who publicly said F Madrid, F Madrid, F Madrid, F Madrid, constantly, publicly hated us, was extremely, extremely ingrained into Catalan culture, publicly insulted us over and over again, and that did not deter Florentino from, from signing him. Um, so you don't have to agree with it, what with that. And I think it's just want to say that I think it's absolutely disastrous if you miss out on him again because you're leaving the club in a situation where you desperately need a striker and you don't have one again because you put all your energy towards it. Having said that, 
if you do and last sign... season we, we missed we missed Holland this season we missed Hurricane I mean uh, but, uh, do but it, it, I... seems, it seems him and PSG do it on purpose they want on until the Hurricane rumors there was there were no noise and Hurricane rumors started and Kylian Mbappe sent a letter it seems they are planning to <laughs> to damage Real Madrid I don't know we are missing or 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 second plan or plan but... B. But I I don't think Holland's barrier was Mbappe. I think Holland's barrier was Benzema. Did you they like Benzema and Holland just can't coexist with Vinicius starting as well? Um, I think that was a bigger barrier. Like if if Benzema had have left last season, I think you you know I think the club really would have made a push to sign Holland. I think that was a bigger barrier than Mbappe. Um, oh, yeah, I agree the, on that. The thing the thing is, Mahan, like I in. Any like if you guys are on the call, like if, I know a lot. I think most people, to be honest, agreed with Lucas more than me on that Mbappe debate was the thing we had the other the other the other week. If you got if 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 he comes here and immediately starts scoring hat tricks, I'm just like just be honest. You can say in the chat, you can unmute yourself. You guys are gonna forgive him pretty quick, and that's like hat trick. Like from, I think it's it's gonna be the first hat trick. Uh, for some people, I think it's gonna be even quicker than the first hat trick. Some people might forget him during his unveiling because he's gonna. I'm pretty sure he's gonna do that whole uno the stress thing if, like, hypothetically, he's ever signed. And uh, so, yeah, I, I guess with Mbappe, it's always interesting as you as Kian mentioned. As a team, we will become like a supernova. We will become like this otherworldly thing if he is plugged into this Real Madrid side, which is basically missing that piece and missing a right back. But uh, with Mbappe, fans are completely in their within their rights who feel strongly about him, how he has uh, behaved about Real Madrid uh, uh, out in the open. But again, as you mentioned, like there are examples of even worse uh, you know things done to real madrid by players like luis figo did and he ended up being a real madrid player and fans enjoyed him so i don't think that's going to be a big problem uh once he starts at madrid and like starts banging in those goals but however i do agree with mahan this is one of my conspiracy theories that mbappe and uh, Al Khalifi, they're like some kind of sick psychopaths who do this to Real Madrid on purpose. All of their like letters, their their I'm gonna leave, I'm not gonna leave for free, I'm gonna leave for free, or renewal bonus, all this whole shenanigans, all of this is like a farce. This is a this is a drama they make up every year to taunt Real Madrid fans. Uh, for some reason, this is one of my conspiracy theories. And uh, regarding Mbappe. I would say this summer is the summer that Real Madrid as a club should draw the line because people ask this in, even in the Managing Madrid podcast, how many times do you do this? I think this is the last time you do this. If he renews this time, like, like see, Mbappe is like 24. If he renews again for a couple of years, he's going to be 26 in a couple of years. He's still going to be a pretty good player in a, in a couple of years. So this is the summer that you draw the line like that. Okay, you, your door closes. You look if at he, other... if he renews, yeah, if he renews, but but if... but not if he's if he just stays and then comes for free next season. I, those are two different things to me. Oh, oh, yeah, th- that is. But I personally don't believe he's like. I I don't think you can sign Kylian Mbappe for free. He's just like you. You can sign David Alaba, Antonio Rudiger for free. You just can't sign Kylian Mbappe. No, you know I what think... I mean. You're talking about yeah. the agent fees and stuff. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I don't. I don't. I think if he doesn't sign for Real Madrid this summer, okay. So that that's my that's I can like quote unquote make it a hot take. That's my hot take. That if he does not sign this summer, uh, from PSG, he is going to eventually renew within the next next year. Like he's not going to like run his contract down and come to Real Madrid for free. Well, I don't. But, I don't. Think, well, that's don't that's think. the that's the that's the concern, and that's why I said it. I don't blame Real Madrid for wanting to pay now because I a year is a long time for a shift to come with another briefcase yeah. to change my, your mind. My, my within, feelings. The last sorry, 
No, no, I was saying that they changed his mind. Like he was supposed to, like everything was done. And then he went to Qatar and then they changed his mind within a couple of days. 365, long, long time to change his mind again. So, uh, my stance on this is like, I think it cannot be any different than what Kian said last week. But Luke is like, I share uh, the sentiment that Lucas shared last year in the heat of the moment. I was very like angry and I was sharing those M PayPal, uh, all of those and like all of that. But at the same time, I remember Luke, uh, Kian and Sid and all of them, they did a podcast. And then in that podcast, they were like, uh, a year from now, two years from now, we're all going to forget it because he's just that kind of a player. And I was pretty confident that I'm not going to let it go. But then I watch him watch that hat trick in the World Cup final and that caliber of player signing for Real Madrid with the talent that we already have in the midfield and in the wings. And you cannot help but just imagine what that squad would look like, especially given the fact that we have been saving that money up for him, you know, for the last three, four years. And, uh, you do not get the opportunity to get a player like Mbappe, you know, again and again. And it's like comes in once in 20 years, like Cristiano, Messi, like they don't come again and again. And in in a world where there are like clubs being bought by uh, states and Saudis uh, where the money is only going to go up more and more and it's only going to get more lucrative. If there's a player who has publicly said many times that he wants to play for Madrid and has betrayed us as well last year. But given the fact that you can give the benefit of doubt that he could have been under huge amounts of pressure from many different parties and he was just 22 years old, 23 years old, uh, I feel from a business standpoint, from a club's future, from stat uh, statistically, there isn't a better player that we can go for. And if you get the chance, you go for it. And soon he will change our, change our minds. And it is more like Cristiano, like, you know, nobody cared about Cristiano, what he talked and the, all the drama outside the pitch, as long as he was performing on the pitch, because that's what you care about. You end up caring about the performances and what you, what the player gives your club. And in the end, only when you stop performing is when your words and your character in the, uh, uh, apart from football is what starts mattering more, which was late Cristiano in United and all of that. So I feel like Mbappe at this point is at the peak of his powers and soon we'll all forget it. And I think there's no way in the world we shouldn't go for him if we can this season. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, it will be sour as, sour as hell if, you know, if he wasn't to come, but uh, we are in every right to go for him. I feel. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, and, and that, it's important to know. Just again, Florentino is going to look at this through pure business terms. He he does not care what the emotions of the fan base, have, what they feel about Mbappe. Regardless, the, he just wants to get a guy who improves the team and is a superstar. And I also, I I think this is something to to just keep our our expectations in check. Which is a scary thought, but I like because we know the number nine shirt has not been given out. Unfortunately, it was not Jesus Vallejo. He was given the number twenty five today. Devastating. I thought it was going to be Vallejo, but the number nine is still open. And I just want to my my hunch is that I think that number nine is not going to be given away. If it's not Mbappe, they're just going to promote Alvaro. I'm going to bank on it right now. That's what's going to happen. Oh, Kian, so you, you don't have, like, uh, I checked it with Ewan. You you actually can keep a number vacant. That's allowed. As long as you have, like, as long as in the 25-man squad, you don't have to give out the number to anyone. Uh, that's that's fine. Uh, you that's, don't yeah, have... that, that, my point is more like, yeah, that my point is more that it's not going to be, you're not they're not going they don't have like a i don't think it's going to be a plan b striker is my point it's like you're not going they're not going to like oh a few days left in the transfer window all right let's go get harry kane you know i, <laughs> I don't think it's going to be like that i think it's going to be all eggs are on the basket and i think whether that's right or wrong i think it's a huge risk um 
I will say, like, I just going back to your thing about the conspiracy. I'm not a conspiracy guy at all, and I don't buy into that one at all either. I think uh, really? that you are Persian. Or? <laughs> I'm more Canadian. You're Persian, I'm more you're Canadian. Not... <laughs> no, I'm more Canadian. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. No, I was you born are my in brother. Canada. I've never been to Iran. <laughs> Uh, all, I'm Persian when I, it comes. I'm Persian when it comes to my mom's cooking, and look, but when Kian, it comes, to I saw your dad, man. and that guy definitely Persian, and you are definitely Persian. I, <laughs> I'm definitely you are, Persian. You go, uh, yeah, and there's Diego, and still no love for conspiracies. Come on, Kian. Not even <laughs> Diego can can turn me into a conspiracy guy. Um, I I just think that. What makes it different than last summer is that there seems to be like last summer PSG were more in the in the mind frame of we got to get this guy at all costs, make sure he stays. This summer, it's more like, F you, man, we're going to send you these letters, very, very passive aggressive, getting mad at you for a verbal agreement. Like, hey, newsflash, verbal agreements hold up zero percentage of the time like verbal agreements mean zero that's it and them getting riled up about a verbal verbal agreement like you gave him this contract you on and that's the other thing is that they threaten with we will sell you like they actually don't have that power they 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 must realize that like this is basic basic stuff you don't have that power like you cannot sell a player against his will it's under contract so mbappe has every right in that scenario um, to say I'm staying or not, uh, I, I it just feels like there is a different. They benched him. They benched Adrian Rabiot for a complete season. They yeah, benched, the, they I I don't think they can do that season. to a, a player like Mbappe. That's a, there's a huge difference, Mahan. Like you 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 can't. It's like you, you just can't do that. I it. But but now his image tarnished in in the RMC sport in the keep they 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 are burning him. Yeah, in that, in, the, in those I mean, yeah. since when? Since when do any of these papers have credibility, Mahan? Like, it doesn't. Like, I don't think that isn't. Like, I, I don't think. I think you can do that with Rabio. I think. I think we could even bench Rabio on the podcast. Like, we could like bench. We could be like Rabio. You're not on the <laughs> podcast tonight. But we can't do that with. But you can't do that with Mbappe. It's a totally different ballgame. Ah. So I, I just think that the, the tension this summer is is different, much different than the atmosphere and the culture that PSG's culture is a mess. We always knew that. But I think there's a level of tension privately and publicly this summer that is just different than last summer that, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I almost feel stuck to my stomach already just like talking about as someone who uh, always preaches, let's stop talking about this guy. I talk about him more than anyone. <laughs> he's just uh, like he's living rent free in my head, man. So I just I just you, hope one way, you, uh, one way or the other. I just hope it's over like I. Just either come yes. or don't. And that's what drives exactly. me nuts is like, it's never like a clear he's not coming or he is coming. It's like, let's let this linger forever. Like, that's what drives me nuts I, about this. So we can't just put a bow on it and wrap it up, you know? Yeah. 